manager at Nova Southeastern University Art Museum, Fort Lauderdale, and director of education and exhibitions at Young at Art Museum. Chadwick earned a BFA from New World School of the Arts, University of Florida, and an MPA from, Nor from Nova Southeastern University. Denny Zulu Jean Tinney, happy birthday again, sir, is a Miami-based visual art artist, writer, independent researcher, semi-retired educator and activist in cultural arts, historic preservation, and social justice issues. He is a co-director of the Dos Amigos Thea Rosamund Slave Ship Replica Project and is active in creating a Middle Passage Coalition Network, an information clearinghouse for organizations and individuals. Mr. Tinney is a trustee of the Virginia Key Beach Park Trust. Good evening, everyone. Happy Black History Month. So I want to start this conversation, um, though we are talking about 2021 and beyond, I always say that if you want to talk about the future and plan for the future, you need to talk about your past. And we have a dynamic group of individuals here. Jean Tinney, Rosie Gordon Wallace have really worked hard to make sure that South Florida acknowledges the presence of Black creatives in this space. I would love to talk to the two of you about what the Miami art scene was like pre-2010, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us. Jean, since you're older than me, I think you should go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Happy birthday, my friend. Happy thank birthday. You. Yeah, get this out while I'm still around to say something, right? I know. Um, <laughs> Well, um, there's a lot that can that, that can be said. Um, I am not a native of Miami, and I came here uh, in 1974. And at the time, I think it's fair to say that the cultural scene, the art scene in Miami was, uh, I guess from the perspective of people familiar with other places, particularly in the North, uh, uh, quite a ways behind. I mean, there was no major art museum. There were, um, the cultural arts just wasn't uh, wired into the community. You didn't have that that support base that, that would come from uh, people who have money. Uh, in fact, those who, who, who were in a position to support it were more likely to support their um, institutions in the places they came from. You know. uh, so that really created, um, there was a void, but I think it was also a great opportunity. So that the, um, a lot of things that were well-established in other, other places, for example, Kwanzaa, was almost unheard of here in Miami. So it, it gave the, those in Miami who were aware of it and I think back to the late Wendell Narcisse, the founder of the Theater of Afro Arts, who was a, uh, you know, a, a uh, major player in raising consciousness of that. Uh, Juneteenth is another example, and uh, you know we have people like um, uh, Officer uh, Von Carroll Kinchins in, in the Overtown area, who are kind of getting, having to plant and cultivate those seeds. Uh, when I got here, I joined a, an organization called the Miami Black Arts Workshop, which was based in Coconut Grove. It was founded in 1969 by art students at the University of Miami, African-American art students, who were basically very keenly aware of the fact that the University of Miami campus has a, a premier uh, art museum, the Low Art Museum, which had never had an exhibition of African-American art. And that African-American art was basically not represented in galleries, it was not being um, represented in, in um, newspapers, you know, by art critics and so forth. So they basically, uh, their first action was to militate to get an art, exhibit, art exhibition at the Low Art Museum. And that created uh, quite the brouhaha <laughs> at the time, but they succeeded. And following that victory, they realized that as worthy as their efforts were on campus, they really needed to have a presence in the community. And so they were able to uh, secure kind of a temporary space in the Brownsville area, that's west of Liberty City, you know, that, that, that area, uh, roughly between, shall we say, 
uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard, uh, 62nd Street and 46th Street along 27th Avenue, just to give you an idea for those who are familiar. And uh, following that, uh, they were able to secure a uh, less permanent, a uh, less temporary space in Coconut Grove, and then finally a more permanent space in Coconut Grove, a, a storefront on Grand and Douglas, for those who are familiar with the Coconut Grove area. Coconut Grove is the oldest part of Miami. It, it was really settled, uh, this part of the history is lesser known, by um, Bahamians before it really became um, uh, more of a quote unquote white uh, area. Uh, the Bahamians were the ones who really provided the knowledge of the local, how do you, what kind of architecture do you build for this kind of climate? What, what are the local plants? What are the, you know, how do you live in, in, in places like this? And uh, I'm, mentioning, I'm mentioning that because that, that kind of history ends up being sort of a microcosm, if you will, of uh, the emergence of the uh, art scene. So uh, the Miami Black Arts Workshop, which I was fortunate to join when I got here, uh, I, you know, uh, it, it was just very fortuitous that I would come from, uh, in this case, I migrated from Boston. And, you know, it's kind of the absurd proposition that I was going to try to, you know, make it in Miami as an artist rather than in other, uh, other fields that I was more professionally trained for and that I should fall into that, that kind of ready-made environment. And the, the, the Black Art Workshop really then became Miami's um, go-to uh, um, incarnation of the Black Arts Movement of the time. Uh, the Black Arts Movement was, of course, nationwide. You had uh, um, brilliant critics like Larry Neal and other people uh, uh, commenting on this in, in all of the disciplines, in literature and dance and in, in uh, drama, spoken word, and so on. But uh, the visual arts, uh, you know, as always, has a kind of um, special place and always has had uh, particularly for us, and I'll, I'll, I'll just throw in, and I don't want to be too verbose because I'm, I'm sure, you know, Rosie has some good insights to, sh to share on this. Uh, but I, I want to share that one of our special moments in, in Miami Black art history was the year that uh, Elizabeth Catlett, whom I'm sure everybody on this call is familiar with, our, our iconic, classic um, printmaker, painter, and, and sculptor, uh, came to Miami and spent some time. She, uh, she was then living in Mexico. And as part of her stay here, uh, there was an exhibit at the main library in her honor. Yeah. But I was uh, teaching at the time at Florida Memorial, then college, now university. And I was able to uh, have her go and speak to the students there. And afterwards, she confided that that was absolutely the high point of her, her visit. But she threw out a, a, a question that was um, uh, very interesting then and is still interesting now, which was she asked the audience why it is that other forms of Black artistic expression, music especially, thrived and survived as it does. I mean, you know, everybody knows, you know, the most famous musicians and so forth. Why was it that art did not have that, that same kind of opportunity and expression? Uh, well, nobody knew the answer. So she had to answer her own question. And she went back to the fact that, well, it goes back to the fact that during slavery time, um, the way the law was written, you were owned, quote unquote, by your owner. And he owned you lock, stock, and barrel, including your time, your labor, and everything else. And so that what happened was that while you could work in the fields and produce music at the same time, the only way to produce art was that you had to have time to yourself, which you rarely had. Um, people found a way to make time, steal time, invent time to do some things, but that stifling effect is something that is, uh, is still with us and it still affects you know, the, the marketplace, if you will. So I just let me just throw those out 
And I'll just bring up one last name before uh, I hand it over to Rosie. Uh, when I got here, I, I think you could almost say that the black, the visual art, black visual art scene in Miami might have been mostly embodied in a single artist who was a sign painter named Johnny Cool, Johnny cool. who had a red and white 54 Cadillac Eldorado with a double continental kit. <laughs> And he did he did signs on stores. He had a classic mm -hmm. style, um, and then he would incorporate illustrations and and, and the like. Mm -hmm. The uh, the Black Arts Workshop, I think, is very fair to say, is the force that established kind of a, of a fine art scene um, in Miami, and went about the business of not only trying to attract people to come to the gallery space that we had, but carrying art to the people. So it was a, it, it initiated a whole different sense of what art is, how it interacts with the community, how in, artists interact with the community. So, um, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that out as just an, a basic introduction. And I know Rosie, you, you have, because you have been right on top of the spreading the word aspect of this. So I will add that I came to Miami, um, thank you, Jean. I came to Miami in 1978. And so I was, um, Jean came, as again, he came before me. <laughs> um, but I wanna call some names because Jean gave you the history that we haven't, that we don't usually hear. I wanna call some names of um, folks that had cultural currency when I, in that time. Barbara Gilman Gallery, woman owned near in the design district. Um, Virginia Miller Gallery in Coconut in, in Carl Gables. Robert McKnight, um, Marvin Weeks. These are these are artists that were around and were working really, really um, diligently. I also want to say that the scholars that were here that I could access, Carol Damian from FIU. Um, Purvis Young. Purvis wasn't known in that time, but Purvis was working and walking the streets of Miami, even from that time. When I came here, I lived um, in Creek Club Apartments across from the VA hospital, just before the McDuffie riots. And Purvis was in the hood. You could see his markings by the library and so on and so forth. So we're looking at the time that the, the definition of art as a cultural marking was is was different, but it was here. Um, for black artists, not so much. And I, I'm glad that um, that Jean talked about the initiative. And also, we have to talk about the African American Heritage Center um, that was there with Mr. Davis, um, um, working with the kids in the neighborhood. So we. I think that what I will leave it there, Melissa, because what I want to say is we talk about things and not being there. We have to also talk about what replaces the things that were not there. And so I'm looking at the 70s and the 80s and saying that those of us that um, Ja has given a little life to live, um, Ja Ja be praised for Jean's birthday again tonight that we have watched this involvement and it is the definitions that have changed. But folks were working, working quietly, and not only working quietly, they were organizing. Um, when you hear Robert McKnight and, and, um, and Marvin Weeks talk about them having to get together, these are two guys. One went to Syracuse University, one went to, I don't remember which one, I know Robert McKnight went to Syracuse, coming to Miami and, um, trying to find a place to do contemporary work. So I, I, I am not one of the people who say that there was no art. I'm saying that it was more difficult to find art of the African diaspora, black artists working in organized and centralized places. So for Adler and Marcus, um, Mikhail, Adrian, Deja, so we've seen, you know, we've already heard 